Okay, we're looking at the uh, the rapture and the events that kind of position the world events, the order of historical and future events, so to find out where the rapture occurs and get an idea of what it really is. Uh, we have the great and terrible day of the Lord, the narrow day of the Lord. We've already discussed that in a number of passages in the previous YouTube. We went back to Zechariah 14, 1 to 5, Joel 3, 9 to 16. Got a characteristic of that. Revelation 16, 12 to 16. Evidence for the narrow sense of the day of the Lord, the great and terrible day of the Lord. Intensive, intensive events. So the great and terrible day of the Lord, the narrow day of the Lord, we should note that Joel 3, 14 to 15 indicates that the sun, moon, and stars will be darkened when the narrow day of the Lord is near. Those heavenly bodies will be darkened before the narrow day comes. And Joel 2.31 declares that the heavenly bodies will be darkened before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. It is obvious from this that Joel 3 and 2, chapter 3 and 2, and referring to the same day of the Lord, <coughs> we can conclude then that the narrow day of Joel 3 and Zechariah 14 is to be identified with the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day in which Christ will come to the earth. Won't be pleasant. In light of what we have seen, we should note we should note that the scriptures apply the expression the great and terrible day of the Lord to the narrow day, not the broad day. The implication is that, that the narrow day will differ from the rest of the broad day, not only in duration, but also in significance. Although the early part of the judgment phase of the broad day will involve a great outpouring of divine wrath upon the dominion of Satan and mankind, the narrow day will be the grand climax of that judgment phase. Thus, E.W. Bollinger, when referring to the day of the Lord in Joel 2.31, said, It is called the great and terrible day of the Lord, as though it were the climax of the whole period known as the day of the Lord. Along similar lines, C.F. Kyle, when referring to the judgment of the now day of Joel 3, declared it is the last decisive judgment in which all the single judgments find their end. The now day will be a great and terrible day of the Lord because in contrast with the earlier part of the judgment phase of the broad day, the narrow day will involve the coming of Christ from heaven to, to the earth. It therefore will do several things. It will expose God's enemies to the actual presence of Christ and the fullness of his divine power and glory, judgment and warfare. It will bring the angelic armies of heaven against these enemies. It will end the rule of Satan and rebellious mankind over the world system and evict them from the earth thus ending their day on earth forever. <clears throat> because the now day of the Lord will bring such a decisive permanent change to the world, the prophet Joel called the place where the grand climax of God's judgment will fall in Satan and rebellious mankind is the valley of decision. Significance of the now versus the broad day of the Lord. There are at least two significant implications of the, the fact that there will be a both, both a broad day and the, of the Lord and a narrow day of the Lord. Since as noted earlier, the narrow day of Joel 3 and Zechariah 14 will take place after a significant part of the broad day has already run its course, and since that narrow day will be the one on which Christ comes to the earth, we can conclude that Christ will come to the earth after a significant part of the broad day has already run its course, after a major part of God's wrath has been poured out upon the world. It will not take place before or at the beginning of the outpouring of God's wrath upon the world. Second, the expression, the great and terrible day of the Lord of Joel 2.31, refers to the narrow day when Christ will come to the earth. Second coming. The rapture is coming to the clouds and extracting the believers of the church out, and then when he comes again seven years later. That's the, uh, the narrow day when Christ will come to the earth. The prophet Malachi 4-5 referred to that same great and terrible day of the Lord as Joel. Malachi used identity the same use identically the same Hebrew words and constructions that Joel used for the great and terrible day of the Lord in 231. So Malachi's great and terrible day of the Lord is also the narrow day, the day on which Christ will come after the 70th week has transpired. Malachi declared that God will send Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord in 4-5. Since Malachi was referring to the narrow day, we can conclude that he was indicating that God will send Elijah before the narrow day, not before the broad day, when God begins to pour out his 
wrath upon the world. In light of the meaning of the great and terrible day of the Lord, Malachi's declaration leaves room for Elijah to come and minister after the broad day has begun, and there, therefore while the wrath of God is being poured out upon the world. So let's, let's take move to the, to the uh, New Testament, the letters of Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-4. Paul writes, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, <coughs> him in the rapture, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report of letters supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. That's after that. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, he goes on, for that day will not come until the apostasia, that's the Greek word for the standing away or the caught away, occurs the and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself, or exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he has sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So Paul is answering in this passage whether or not the tribulation period had already begun, because that was the concern of the believers in Thessalonica. <clears throat> Notice that the mention of the deceptive teaching referred to in verses 2 to 3, which was falsely attributed to Paul, Paul's answer is no, the tribulation has not yet begun. And he gives two reasons for this in verse 3. The first being that the apostasia, the catching up of, has not yet occurred. And the second, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, has not yet been revealed in the world. So the players haven't even occurred, and the play hasn't started occurring either. The day of God's wrath in the tribulation period will not come until the apostasia occurs. <clears throat> So the day of the Lord will not occur until the apostasia occurs. Let's address that. The derivation and available meanings of apostasia and apostasion. <coughs> Those are the actual Greek words that, uh, that were written by the, uh, the Bible writers of the Greek New Testament. The noun he, apostasia, meaning the catching away, is in this precise form is a feminine noun. It is used nowhere else in the New Testament. So its meaning must be defined by its contents here. It is derived from two Greek words, apo, meaning away from, and stasis, meaning standing. It could properly be rendered standing away, in the sense of a physical departure, rather than falling away from a religious conviction, in the sense of the Greek English word apostasy. It can mean that, depends upon context. So the noun he, apostasia, comes from the verb episteme, meaning to go away or depart can mean the falling away as in the apostasy or the rebellion or it can mean the standing away as in the rapture because we're going to be caught up and stand away from the earth in the clouds this word apostasia is used only in one other place in the bible acts 21 21 meaning there is to turn away from or depart from hey apostasia has commonly been transliterated as the apostasy so the, and the uh, the noun Apostasion, neuter of a presumed adjective from a derivative of episteme, something separative, i.e. divorced or divorcement. So apostasion is a compound formed by the joining of two separate Greek words. The preposition apo from, away from, is a, a, added to a prefix stasis, which means a standing or a state existence. It imparts to the reader the idea of standing off from someone or something. When used with reference to the state of marriage, it bespeaks of a state of existence in which there is a standing away from one another. The one flesh state of being between a man and a woman is severed. Their lives are no longer intertwined. They have parted company and each stands separately and apart from the other. Generally, apostasion is used in conjunction with the word biblion, scroll, or document, or certificate, and the resultant phrase is most often translated certificate of divorce. It was thus an official document signifying the termination of a covenant of marriage between a husband and a wife. From a legal perspective, they would therefore be recognized as state existing in a state separate and apart from one another. The state of union was no longer regarded as, as existing. This particular word appears only three times within the pages of the New Testament documents in Matthew and Mark. In the Septuagint, it can be found in Deuteronomy 24, 3 and 5, Isaiah 51, and Jeremiah 3, 8. Old Testament Hebrew is translated into that Greek word. So the biblical usage of apostasia and apostasion, the translation of apostasia, some versions, 
in some versions which is departing does not give any more credence to the rapture views since the English word departing can be used in both the spatial and a non-spatial sense. In Hebrews 3.12, the King James Version says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Obviously, this departing is not a spatial one, theological. In the Septuagint, apostasy is found five times. It also occurs seven times in Aquila, in his writings, once in Theodotin, and twice in Symmachus. In every one of these instances, from the Old Testament and Apocrypha, the meaning is religious or political defection. So apostasy is only used one other time in the New Testament, Acts 21:21, 21, 21, to describe forsaking or going away from the teachings of Moses, the law. Acts 21. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away apostasy and from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to their customs. Here it is agreed that apostasy and refers to a religious departure or apostasy. The cognate verb of apostasia, epistemi, is found 14 times in the New Testament. It is used in both a spatial and a non-spatial sense. Only three times is it used of religious apostasy. No one questions the fact that the word must often designate a spatial departure. It is found with that meaning throughout all periods of Greek literature. As was noted earlier, a major part of the case for understanding apostasy as a spatial departure is its relationship to its cognate uh, verb, epistemi. The argument suggests that the meaning of the verb can also be applied to the, the noun. It is evident that the verb epistemi does, not, does have the meaning to depart in the New Testament in a very general sense, which is not specialized as being related to rebellion against God or forsaking the faith. And since a noun takes its meaning from the verb, the noun too may have such a broad connotation. So apostasion Another closely related noun appears in Matthew 5, 31, 19, 7, and Mark 10, 4, where it describes a writing of divorcement or papers that separate. Thus, we do have a spatial departure in view. It's going to amount, to amount to just the context and what meaning of the word we can apply best. In Matthew 5, 31, 19, 7, it has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Apostasy on Mark 10, 4. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. So we understand that. Ancient usage of apostasy was used in biblical Greek literature to describe political revolt or going away from the establishment and in the Septuagint when the Jews go, would go away from God to worship other gods. So apostasy apparently first occurs in Greek literature outside the Bible in the first century B.C. Lamp's lexicon of the patri patristic period also limit, lists a revolt, defection, primary meaning of apostasia. We have one example given a spatial departure, which is found in New Testament apocryphal work, the Assumption of the Virgin. We read, the, the Holy Ghost said to the apostles and the Mother of the Lord, Behold, the governor has sent the captain of a thousand against you because the Jews have made a tumult. Tum tumult. Go out there, therefore, from Bethlehem, and fear not, for behold, I will bring you a, a, by a cloud of Jerusalem. So the apostles, therefore, rose up straight away, went out of the house, bearing the bed of their lady, uh, the mother of God, went forward towards Jerusalem, and immediately, just as the Holy Ghost said, they were lifted up by a cloud, and were found in Jerusalem in the house of their lady. Here we have clearly the description of a rapture of the apostles and the mother of the Lord. The story continues in section 33, although this is fiction, but when the captain came to Bethlehem and did not find there the mother of the Lord, nor the apostles, he laid, upon the Beth, laid hold upon the Bethlehemites, for the captain did not know of the departure of the apostles and the mother of the Lord to Jerusalem. So this is a, a rapture in uh, uh, fictional religious literature, which is similar to the one in the Bible. So rapture is now described as a departure, the Greek word being apostasia. It's clear evidence that apostasia can indeed refer to the rapture. So, that's probably why this meaning is not found in the standard New Testament lexicon by Bauer nor by his predecessor. The, some of the uh, dictionaries don't include the meaning, yet there's plenty of testimony to it. Consider the New Testament lexicons are limited to the interpretations of theologians relative to particular Bible versions. You have to be careful because that's their interpretation not how the word is generally used. 
in the way